Thérol yeah. is, um, is a Senegalese word, like uh, specifically Wolof. Wolof. So now there is something new you can learn, like Wolof. Wolof. Um, <laughs> it means welcome. And mm -hmm. Senegal, I come from Senegal. Um, it's uh, really the country, we call it the country of Teranga, because when uh, foreigners come to our country, uh, we will welcome them as family. It's even like we will let them the best room in the house. Uh, even people, if they don't have money, they will invest all to buy food or to make them happy or to please uh, the newcomers. Mm -hmm. So we are renowned to be the Teranga, the Teranga country. And that's why yeah. we chose this name um, to uh, our uh, group because we want everyone to feel uh, welcomed and everyone to feel like this is the place where they can share, they can grow, they can find other people to share their journey. And it, not, it doesn't have to be only a lonely journey as an entrepreneur or even as a business person coming in mm -hmm. uh, Shanghai. But even for people from China, actually, because, uh, you know, most of pe many people come to Shanghai and they're not from Shanghai. So it's also a good occasion to meet others and especially like minded people, because when you come to an event, yeah. it's most probably that you share the same interest. So you can find also yeah. other people to meet. And that's why I encourage you as well to uh, join our groups so you can also get to know uh, more people. And uh, we try our best, we are volunteers, we try our best, but we don't have all the time, of course, but we try our best to do one, one event every week. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the team, Kitso, uh, from South Africa, who is always uh, also helping, copywriting, she's really great. Kizito, who is helping with the videos, editing, and uh, that we can provide you guys uh, our event. So even if you cannot come this time, you can watch it. So that is also really great to have this. Uh, we have Mac, who is the co-founder. He's also uh, from Senegal and he will bring very soon, we have a new type of event coming. Um, so I'm very excited. And Mac is working hard to bring it to life. So very soon we will be publishing yeah. it in the groups. So we have as well Kims, um, that uh, is a volunteer and is helping a lot with marketing. And we have a newcomer, her name is Graziela. She didn't yet start it, but it's just that the team is growing and now we are six people working together to bring you the events um, so we can share and we can grow together. So, and lastly, but not least, thank you all of you guys who are coming to the events, who are giving inputs, who are helping us and push us to um, to go beyond and uh, you, you really motivate us to do even more. So, and thank you X for accepting <laughs> to share your knowledge and I'm super excited to know more and I will leave you the floor yes. now. Thank you so much. Ah, okay. Um, hello everybody. Um, as Isabel has introduced, my name is X. The reason it's become X is because Olisile is a bit of a mouthful. So just for everybody to make it easy and more conversational, X is just a nickname that I've had for a very, very long time. And basically what I do is I'm a mental health strategist and we're having just a quick discussion about, you know, the industry of mental health or psychologists and how they've basically not had a good or don't have a good reputation that most people sort of go to psychologists when it's depression when it's very deep and it's the last resort type of thing and i'm always just wanting new ways to try and represent or present psychology in a way that we can actually use it right it's the study of self of how our mind works and so if we can really get ourselves into that mode of understanding we can use this in different aspects in business we can use it for procrastination we could use it even in relationships right um so hopefully this you can gain from it sales process that you can actually use, as I was saying, to sell water if your product is water, um, to sell whatever it is that you need to sell. I personally will be focusing on getting you to sell writing that thesis that you've been trying to write for the last five years, or going to the gym, or uh, eating healthy, or drinking water. This is, that's personal. I have a relationship with water that's in and out. So that one is very personal to me. Um, so basically, 
looking at everything from a business perspective, I always try and stem any knowledge I have from different industries. And I think it's something that is very valuable as entrepreneurs to look at different industries and what are they doing. So if you are selling water, uh, look at how other companies, look at how vets are marketing, look at how mortuaries are marketing, look at how funeral parlors are marketing because they too have a product, they too have a service that they have to market. And sometimes when we focus only on if a marketer, I will only look at how the marketers are working. Sometimes I can always bring a wall that can actually block us and we won't actually succeed. So that's just from a business perspective. And that's what's gotten me to take a sales book and use it to try and beat something that's more psychological as procrastination. So just so that we can see where my thinking and the link is um, there. So I would take that and move forward with it however you wish to as well. The first thing I would like to look at is the actual word. Um, so I will actually be, be sharing a PPT. If you cannot see the PPT, please let me know. I'm happy to share the PPT and you can always look at it. Just a heads up, if I speak of a person and then another person, I'm speaking about you. At no point will I be speaking about another person. So this is me trying to get you to get you to do things that you need to do. Okay, so any point I say prospect, that's still you. Anytime I say salesperson, that's still you. So if it sounds like a muddling and a mixing, it's actually very purposeful. And I'm actually talking about yourself, right? So just keep that, just keep that in mind with me. Um, just looking here is the PPT. All right, cool. Just, I don't know. I cannot see anybody when I have the PPT on, so just bear with me. Um, and it's we good. Will just okay. Exactly. <laughs> I basically can see uh, most people that have their videos on, so I can just see you guys. So if I don't see anybody, just note. Okay, so the book is called Sell or Be Sold. It is by Grant Cardone. You can actually buy the book. You can find the book online. There is a guy that reads it for six hours. It's gruesome, but he does. And kudos to him. So you can actually listen to the book. From a sales perspective, as a person who's selling a product, I would really encourage listening to that book or reading that book just in general. Um, there ha are lots of pointers to keep in mind and that's why it jumped out at me as something to take into psychology. So you sell or be sold and this is coming from the perspective if you're not doing what you want to do it means you're doing what somebody else wants you to do right so that's where the concept of sell or be sold so if you are deliberate about what you are doing that means you are selling yourself so when you wake up at eight o'clock it means you are selling yourself and waking up at eight o'clock or five o'clock or four o'clock don't go to four o'clock but whatever it is that you are doing if you're doing that over doing something else that you don't want to do it just means that your selling process is better than that other activity right so basically we we're pitching goals to ourselves and closing ourselves and breaking the cycle of unproductive behavior right you want to be in a position where your whole day has action you are doing something that you wanting to do and procrastination will say that you are doing things that you don't want to do the whole day right um so two things to keep in mind motivation Versus, versus actual selling, right? Motivation, if we just break down the word, I am an English teacher, so just bear with me. <laughs> uh, so motive, right, which means reason, uh, and then Asian, which means designate or give signal. So if you put those together, we can think that motivation is signaling a reason, right? So that's why you can actually watch like 3,000 YouTube videos about what you should be doing, this is what you should be doing. And they have all these great, and you like, you actually feel warm and, and encouraged to do something. And the next thing you do is you switch to another video, right? Because all they did is just signal a reason. It didn't actually get you to do something. So this is why for myself, I feel that motivation um, actually works when you are in motion and you actually are doing something. So if you've already started jogging, 
and somebody says to you, Jayo, Jayo, it pushes you further. But if you haven't even put your tackies on or sneakers on, I could Jayo until the roosters come home. You're still not going to do anything, right? So you want to be in a position where you're already doing something and then you can call upon motivation to push you to the next level. Hacks. Again, work best when you're already doing something because hacks make things easier. If you find a hack about running, right? If somebody says, don't wear sneakers and run barefoot, that's a hack for somebody that's already running. That's not a hack for somebody that's thinking about running. So you're already in doing mode and the not wearing of shoes makes you run faster. It makes whatever you're doing that much easier. Now, selling all together is re, it's introducing, it's reintroducing, it's uh, presenting a product to yourself. So it can be completely new. Think about um, Apple when they bought out the Mac, when they bought out the iPhone, when Samsung bought out, what does Samsung bring out? <laughs> I'm kidding. When Samsung... <laughs> When Samsung bought the phone, right, um, they introduced the product when we didn't have smartphones at that time. They almost introduced a new thing. So if you haven't been doing anything for a very long time, exercise, it's almost like a new thing to you. So you almost have to present it as a new thing altogether. And that's where the selling process comes in. So now we are, ooh. oh, this is very fancy. Okay, so oh, the problem, so I just want so that we're clear on the terms or the distinctions that I'm going to be making. Keep in mind, again, you can use this as an actual sales process for yourself. Uh, just know the nuances when it works for actual sales of, again, selling actual water. So the problem um, and who's who. So you are the prospect and I want to distinguish between a customer and a prospect. A customer is somebody that might buy something, right? So I might be a customer to Chanel because if they have something maybe for a hundred quai, I might buy it, right? Um, but if I'm super rich and I'm walking around absolutely bougie and I have extra cash running out, I'm a prospect for Chanel because I have 99.9999% chance of actually buying something from them, right? So we need to look at ourselves as a prospect and if you are able to know your prospect you can convert them into a client now a client is lifelong doctors uh, or pediatrician pa oh pediatrician general practitioners let's call them that general practitioners dentists are people that have clients because they will treat the first person so the first uh, prospect will be some father, mother, whoever that can afford their product and need their service. So they will treat them. Then they will be so good that that person will bring their children. That person will bring their children's children. And that's how you end up having a family doctor, a family lawyer, a family, whatever, because they were able to find the right prospect, convert them into a, a client and a client is lifelong. A customer just comes in, can buy, might buy, and if they do buy, they buy once and then they probably won't come back again. And I would argue that they're not the person you're looking for and you're trying to, you, you might want to avoid them almost altogether. You might give them attention every now and again, but avoid them altogether, right? So remember for you, because you can't really get rid of yourself. So you want to get yourself to client level where you commit to yourself for the longevity. You're not just trying to exercise for the next five months because you're going to get married and you want to look cute in your wedding dress or whatever. You want to be healthy for the rest of your life so that you have a good life when you become a grandmother, a great grandmother, if you get to that age, etc. So it's not just like a trend that you're trying to get into. You want to sell yourself and to the point where you are selling to a client, not a customer. In terms of goals, goals, uh, this is your wanting to go to the gym more, you wanting to drink more water, you wanting to write a thesis, you wanting to whatever, right? So your goals are your actual product the same way an iPhone, the same way 
a, a table, the same way a couch, a house, etc. Right. And the commission, so there's three parts to it. The commission is then what you get out of it. If you exercise, right? So if you have the product and you sell the product of exercising, your commission is then that you are healthy, right? So that's where the sales and the commission part come in. The same way that a real estate agent or realtor will sell a house, physical product, and then their commission will be money. Right. Um, and depending on how well they do, they might get a really, really good bonus. Right. Um, so that's something to think about. If you get really good at it, you can actually get a bonus out of it. So you sell uh, the thesis and you become a doctor, a doctor, doctor candidate. Right. And that's your gain out of it. Right. So that's just the distinction so that we know where, what, how and how I've um, connected everything for us. OK. So this is jumping ahead. Okay, so know thy prospects. Like, if you go into a niche market, right? Um, and I'm, I'm I struggle to see. I'm going to try and see your your comments. Um, if you go into a niche market, what would you say would be rule number one um, before you present your product to the market? Like, if especially if you're going into niche. Uh, not like general cell phones and, and everything like that, because that's almost general knowledge now. Um, if you're trying to sell something very rare, very specific, what would you consider as the first thing to do or to think about before you get on with it? <laughs> you can send uh, messages on the chat uh, or feel free to actually converse with me on the video. <laughs> Don't cheat. Don't read my PPT. <laughs> uh, okay, I see. Okay, so for me to see chats and at the same time. Um, know your, yes, Maria. Yes, thank you. Know your or who your audience is, right? So in this instance, it's going to be know thy prospect, which is you. You have to know yourself. Um, and, and relying on knowledge that your parents have passed on, your friends have passed on, can give you guidance, but you have to be very particular and consistent in knowing thyself and digging up and really looking um, at what makes you tick, what makes you happy, what makes you angry. The same way that Facebook, you know, the same way that Instagram, Twitter, they do this. They really have me, they hire neuropsychologists, neurosurgeons, all these people, and they pay them a huge sum of money because they're wanting to study the brain, you, right? And do things to you that you think, oh, I made that decision. No, you didn't. <laughs> you were strategically placed in a position where you were so comfortable, you actually thought that you made the decision. And that's how good it is. You feel like you did that. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, you didn't. Um, but that's what you wanted to get to, where it's that very comfortable position where you don't think twice about getting yourself to the desk and writing a thesis. You don't think twice about putting your trainers on. You just, you just do it, right? And it feels almost the same way that you feel about breathing. You just do it, right? Um, and so it, it's also the easiest way to save money and even heartache. Let's go with the example of exercise. If you look at an advert and you don't know yourself, you're gonna look at yoga and you think, okay, yoga is gonna be the one. That's what's gonna make me lose weight, okay? And then three days later, they start, ex they start uh, marketing water. If you drink enough water, you will lose weight. What do you do? You start drinking water and you forget the yoga. And then when they've introduced something else, going to gym, this and this, this and that. How many of us have bought gym equipment to our home from Taobao? Ooh. Can you hear me, Isabel? Oh, uh, yes. We uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you check your audio setting or just leave and come back? Is that to me? No, 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 no. That's cool. Yeah. Oh. Don't worry. Don't worry. We are 
we are responding to uh, some questions uh, in the chat. For you. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, cool. Sorry, okay. sorry. Um, so yeah, if you if you are not acquainted with who you are, what will happen is that every time there's a new way of doing something, you'll jump on that wagon, jump on that wagon, jump on that wagon, until you actually get comfortable with the fact that you know what, climbing a mountain, that's how I lose weight. That's what makes me happy. And that's what you end up doing. And what you find is that because you're in a position of happiness, you're in a position of almost balance, you actually start losing your weight. And you don't feel it because you're doing something that you enjoy, right? But some of us want to be in a position that, oh, yeah, good, good, good. It's like, that doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. And until you get comfortable with understanding that some things work, for everyone and you might just be that one person that it doesn't work for and that's okay you just need to find what works for you and that's going to save you a lot of money as well because you won't be buying unnecessary things right <laughs> so from a perspective point of view we're going to look at professionals versus amateurs so I'm going to say that the Twitters the social medias are professional salespeople right? They, they are winning at the sales process thing. And we mere mortals are the amateurs. But the nice thing about even the word amateur implies that you can actually graduate or learn all the way to professional because the adult of amateur is professional, right? That's the natural progression. So you want to just look at it from that position. So if you're not doing things right now, if you are procrastinating right now, it's not that deep. You're not a horrible person. You're not going to go to hell and you're not going to be a terrible person. And it sounds very like comical to laugh about that little statement. But most of the time when we procrastinate, we are so mean to ourselves. We're just like, oh, you're such a failure. Uh, and some people can get quite deep. Like this is why you're like your father and you'll never amount to something. And you have this conversation in your head. And you think, oh, nobody can hear me, therefore it's okay. Unfortunately, we do have something dubbed the subconscious mind, uh, and that records everything. Think of Siri, think of that recording device in, in Facebook where they record things, and if you say cat food, cat food long enough, that theory uh, <laughs> that all of a sudden all these ads about cat food will pop up now conspiracy no conspiracy mm, i'm gonna leave that up to you however i do know that the subconscious mind works like siri or i'm gonna say the series or they use the research in understanding the subconscious to create the series right? The Siri does not take a joke. If you say, ha ha, cat food, it's still going to be like cat food. If you are angry and you say cat food, it doesn't care. It still take cat food, right? So when you sit after not having studied or having not done what you need to do and you say, oh, I'm such a loser, you think, oh, they can't hear me. Therefore, it's okay. But your subconscious is like, oh, this thing all this thing and so we wonder three months down the line why we have such a bad self-esteem or why we can't get ourselves excited about certain things so it's little voices those little oh you're a loser oh you're so fat oh you're this oh you're this and we never rebuttal we never fight it we just accept and let it go and it has to grow something has to come of it right so just think about that um so just from high achievers or professionals the only reason another person does is because the doing, so the action, is more valuable than the inaction. That's just as simple as that. It's more important for you to write the thesis than it is not to write the thesis. It's more important for you to go to gym than it is for you not to go to gym. If you can get yourself in an understanding where it's at that level, then there's less argument. If you look at the alcoholic, I had to actually Google the name of the series because I haven't watched um, like series in a long time. But think of Shameless, right? If you talk about alcoholism to the, the next level, right? Um, there is nothing that they could do to get him to stop drinking. 
and I haven't watched it in a long time and I don't know if he's actually stopped drinking, but I will keep in mind the only time he will stop drinking is when drink, not drinking is more valuable than drinking. You can say, but your children, but your health, but your wife, but your whatever, until they decide that not drinking is more valuable than drinking and they have a reason that resonates with them, good luck giving them reasons, right? And so the same thing in going to knowing thyself, understand that you need to give yourself a reason that resonates with you, not the grander society, not what the parents say that should, not what your partner, what you resonate with. And if it's silly, it doesn't matter. It still resonates with you, right? Um, and then amateurs are the procrastinators. And um, so basically questions are what and why are you doing something? So why are you doing what you are doing? So why are you watching Netflix? Why are you doing uh, not reading? Why are you watching TV? Why are you scrolling through Instagram unnecessarily, Facebook? Why are you doing that? And what is it that you're doing? Look at what value does that bring to your life? Going on Instagram, what value does it actually bring to your life? And it's very important to be very honest about this. I will give an example with Facebook. I stopped using Facebook. One, because it takes a lot of time. You actually never, they're so good. Oh, Facebook is so good. Um, but you never, you never want to leave because they, they know how to stop you from leaving, right? And so I, I noticed that I had a tendency to not know how to appreciate another person's success after I had been on Facebook for a very long time. So I would look at maybe somebody that I thought was a loser in high school and then I'll see them being successful. And then I think to myself, <gasps> where am I in life? How is it possible that they're doing it? They must be doing something else dodgy on the side. And that's cool because that means if I can't be happy for somebody else, how on earth will I learn how to be happy for myself? And, and, and that was just such a pervasive environment that I cut facebook completely just because it's not my place to be unhappy for somebody else's success right so just be very aware of why you're doing something what value does it bring to your life and so it was easy to transition to reading because reading gave me more value to my life so i swapped them around um, what benefits do you get out of doing something that instead of doing the other thing and what ease does it bring to your life if you're watching TV over doing the thesis, right? If you have the thesis done and you become a doctorate, it will bring, it will bring a couple of things to you. You will get paid more. I hope fight for that. <laughs> You'll get paid more, which means you'll probably be more likely to dictate your time that you work. You'll be more likely to have time for your children. You'll be more likely to have all of these other things that obviously if you negotiate for and all that good stuff, but that's what it's that's what the possibilities are there right and we are pleasure seekers so when you're trying to raise the value of something else come from a pleasure perspective don't come from you will be a great person come what pleasure will it bring me to do to write this thesis what pleasure will it bring me to exercise and be a healthy person because we are very much conscious about <laughs> Uh, pleasure okay I'm um, just going into here and then we're just going to take a breather <laughs> so that we can just collect our thoughts uh, the price myth so if you are in a niche especially you'll find that you may be struggling with the part that says my product my water is 4,000 renminbi and people are like what it's just water oh my gosh da, 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 da. right um <laughs> and the thing is nothing is expensive right if you can understand that as a salesperson as a person is in business nothing is expensive if you can make the value of your product more valuable than the price that a client has then you don't have to deal with the actual numbers 
right? You can literally almost write numbers in the air and they will say yes irregardless. Think about things like um, there are people that are selling deals for a billion. So what's 4,000 RMB in terms of relative scale? It means that somebody that can sell something for a billion, they have made that bottle of water worth a billion and much more. So you then raise the value of the product um, and then things like price will just flutter. And people will actually be like, oh, I thought it would be more than that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, cool. Where do I sign, right? <laughs> but so break down procrastination. Two aspects. One is what am I afraid of? And in terms of this, it's always easy to see failure and to survive failure because most people have experienced failure so most of your friends family members and even strangers so what you'll find is that you will be you'll fail at something and then you'll go home and then you'll talk to your parents and then they'll say oh son i too had this moment it was a very good moment and i grew from it right there's always somebody to give you a tale about how to survive failure. Now, on the flip side of things, I think there needs to be more conversation on how to teach us to accept and to celebrate success and to prepare ourselves for success and to understand that we can actually be afraid of success. So if you think of that speech by Nelson Mandela, I'm not sure if he wrote it himself or he took it from somebody else, but speeches are always borrowed. So um, but it basically, our deepest fear is that we are more powerful than uh, beyond measure. So sometimes you might actually be avoiding to write that thesis. You might actually be avoiding going to that gym because of what that would mean. If you have been, uh, and, and sorry to be crude, but if you've been a fat person your whole life, if you now are a skinny person, people will treat you differently you will experience different things and you will go through some emotional things that I wish in the TV shows, especially those losing weight ones, would prepare people for. The amount of attention that you will get as a skinny person and you have a comparative view that three years ago, nobody looked at me. Now people can't stop staring at me and people are even starting to fondle me. You have to prepare yourself for that, right? The same thing with PhD, what does that mean? You're going to be a doctor. Well, that's cool if you come from a family of doctors. But if you're the first doctor, are you actually a little bit afraid of what that means? Because now you're going to have to be the doctor. You have to then be the identity that people will ascribe with that thing. So just also a different perspective from a success type of thing. Not all things are all terrible things only come from failure. Sometimes even success can make us a little bit uncomfortable. So that's why, what am I afraid of? Um, what will happen if I do this? So that goes into, you know, will people look at me differently? Will people treat me differently, etc. cetera? And, and prepare yourself of how you're going to deal with that. Hang around with skinny people and ask them, what do they do with this, right? Um, and, you know, they look at, can I actually do the thing that I'm avoiding to do. Sometimes we procrastinate because we actually don't know how to do something, right? And I'll use an example with Canva and I love Canva now. I love it. It's the easiest thing to do. And I never used to use it because I actually didn't know how to. So I procrastinated and had I not been conscious of the fact that it was a skill issue, right? Not a self issue. I would have burnt myself out and you know said horrible things to myself about how I'm a failure I can't figure this thing out instead of googling how to use Canva and actually fix the skill and learn the skill and use the skill and it the minute I figured out how to use it you can't stop me me and Canva we are one right and so sometimes you also just need to look at where your skill set is in relation to the thing that you are avoiding to do um, and then why am I doing back to who you are? Why am I doing something? And then accept that you don't have to do it. 
There is not one thing in this world, unless you're a parent, please look after your children, but there's not one thing in this world that you have to do. Nothing. You can be a homeless person. You can. Some survive their whole life. It's okay. You can do it, right? And the thing is, that refusal, that part of you that says, no, I don't, I don't want to be a homeless person, use that answer, use that reason to drive you to do what you have to do, right? Because then you need, that can sort of signify to you why you're wanting to do something. And that can drive force the type of energy that you need to get you going. Okay. <laughs> that would be a breather. Everybody take a sip of water. <laughs> And let's just let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> oh, okay. I only have like a little one. <laughs> Isabel is coming in with a whole liter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have another event later. So I, I oh, need to have a lot of water. <laughs> okay. Jayo. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, so let's, oh, let, let me then sort of move at a, a quicker pace then. Okay, so now you have the price myth. Uh, just two seconds for your own business. Think about that when you are, if you are afraid to name, your, name the number. If you are afraid to name the number, always overvalue, over deliver on value that the number is just, it's literally just numbers. And that just has, happens to have a dollar sign next to it, happens to have a renminbi, a rand sign next to it, right? Um, and you, you've had instances when somebody wants your products, needs your products, understands the value of your products, and it's almost felt too easy. They're just like, oh, okay, cool, let's go. So that's just from a sales perspective, over deliver. All right, so buyer's money, going back to people's money, right? Biggest sales issue is people don't want to give me their money. Like I give them everything, but I need the actual money. <laughs> um, again, I then look at it energy, right? People don't want to do things. I don't have the energy to do it. I'm too tired. I'm such a lazy person, right? Uh, money is not to be possessed. Money needs to move. And, and like you have your perspective about this but the more money moves the more money grows and the same thing with energy if you want energy you have to use energy more energy makes more energy so you'll hear friends who exercise they'll say i went to the gym and i was a little bit tired but you know once i got going look, look at me wow! and they're ready to take over the world because energy creates more energy but if you sit there and you're feeling tired and you say to yourself, oh, I'm tired, I need more energy, it's, it's not coming from anywhere. Even if you just pick up your hand and, and you'll feel the difference, just, just do this and you stand up and down. You know, when you're tired and if you actually are doing things now and you've got yourself going and you're running out of energy, so you, you write the thesis for two pages and then you're just like, ugh, because it's so boring. <laughs> then you actually get up, get some energy going, jog on the spot type of thing. Um, look at how to actually get motion. Look at yourself and how you can um, get more energy and um, that really will give you more energy to carry on, right? Um, and then you get sort of momentum. And another thing is that results beget results. Please, pen to paper, Isabel, speaking about pen to paper. <laughs> um, please, KPI, KPI your progress, right? So the way you'll keep tabs on your business. I started my business with $100, the month next, I had $120. <laughs> and the other month, I had uh, more money or whatever, right? You need to keep tabs on that because technically, if you had, if you started with $100 and then you make $120, you've made some money. There's some growth happening, right? But if you're wanting to make it's a corner, and you overlook, and you overlook the processes and the KPI, you might actually think you're failing and you might not be failing. You really need to have KPIs. So keep tabs of the times when you do actually get yourself to do something. Keep tabs of that and look at it and be able to see it so that you can evaluate and have ocular proof 
that you are actually successful, that you are actually moving because you do need to prove to yourself that you are successful so that the things that you say to yourself actually has more weight. So when you're trying to get yourself to do things, you'd be like, you remember last month we jogged this much and we lost this much and basically here's the proof. We did this, we did this and we did this and then you think to yourself, from a logical perspective, okay, there's actual reasoning, this is actually working, right? And what do you do when you look at a company that has proof that it's successful? If you have money, you invest in it, right? So you keep putting more energy and you're more likely to invest in yourself or keep doing things because you can see there is some success there. Uh, general, love your product, love the service, love the customer, love yourself. I'm gonna bunch them up together in a way like this product obviously being whatever it is that you're wanting to do love what you need to do learn to add value to create value to the thesis to the running to the drinking water in a way that sells it to you love the service negative motivation oh it can work it has a place in the world but it's not for long longevity it's not a checkers type of thinking. It's not a chess type of thinking. It's very checkers. It's very here and now because you can hype yourself up. You're going to be a loser if you don't write this thesis. Okay, that might work for the next three pages, but it's probably more conducive to come from a more positive positioning where it's actually more intrinsic support and love. The same way that you will treat your customer. You know, if you don't have good service, and this is full circus, full circle. This is me coming into your shop. This is me looking at your products. This is me buying your products. This is me leaving your products. This is you checking up on me about the product that I've just bought from you. That is the whole sales process. Not the, it doesn't stop when I give you money and you give me water, right? That's how you deal with customers. But if you want them to deal with clients, you have to be, oh, hello, Miss Isabel. Oh, hi. You know, you're very kind. Your service is very nice, right? And you come in, you show them all the way, everything available, and you give them what's valuable to them. If you look up Jay Abrahams, one of the people that I also synthesize with, um, he talks about the strategy of preeminence. You can always look that up because it's quite a big uh, topic. However, it's basically getting to the point where your product, your service, or you as a brand, uh, a company, are the only option to the client. When they think about water, they only think about Maria. Only. You have put yourself in a position where you are honest to your client. So if they come in and they want five liters of water, and you know that's going to drown them, you say to them, even though you know you will make more money by selling them five liters, you say, no, X, you don't need five liters. You need one, you need 500, and that's what you need to drink for the next three months. And then when you get to that three months, we're going to move you up. And they can scream and shout like a little child, oh, no, you don't. But if, you, if they understand where you're coming from and you're being honest, and you'll see this with clients who go somewhere, and then they'll say, Oh, no, no, don't get that. It's a little bit expensive. You have that almost instantaneous trust with them. You're like, oh, okay, I know they can be honest, right? Okay. Oh, so now you're more open to listening to them. So you want to be in a position of using the strategy of preeminence, even with yourself. So you know when to stop. You know that you, you need to only write five pages. You know you only need to exercise for two, for two hours. You don't need to be exercising for two and a half hours. You don't need to be exercising for two hours and one minute. Stop. When you need to stop, you need to stop. And you need to build integrity within yourself that when you say something, you do it. When you say, I will wake up at eight, you do it. Not because you want to show up to your friends that you're an early bird, but because you want to build a trust in yourself that when you say, I want to do something, I do it. Anybody that meditates understands that's basically what meditation is. You're getting yourself in a position where you, the other part of you, tells you to sit down and be quiet. 
And as you get the itch to get up, you say, hey, sit down, right? And it gets easier and easier and you can get to a point where you can snap into meditation just like that. And so the same type of thing you want to get in terms of procrastination, get yourself to do things because you can trust yourself. If X says we're going to exercise for two hours, that's what we'll do. We're not suddenly going to put in five hours now because now you've lied to yourself. Yes, you might feel, oh yeah, I'm so motivated. I should just push myself. But you've lied to yourself. You said two hours. And look, if you're a high achiever and you already do this, you can almost play around and do more and all that stuff. But if you're still at the very sensitive stage, you're lying to yourself. And you then go home and then the next day you're like, okay, let's exercise again. And almost like a little child in you says, yeah, but last time you said two hours and we ended up being there for five hours. I don't want to go. No, 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 no. I'm not going there. And you might not say it in the exact same word, but you find yourself fighting with yourself and you're confused. Yesterday we went to gym. What's the problem? We, we were able to do this so easy yesterday. What's going on now, right? But those little moments where just, ah, you said two hours and you were there for five hours. I'm not going there again, right? So just be very attentive to the honesty and being very clear with yourself with that. Uh, love yourself. If you don't know how to love yourself, you struggle to love others. If you don't have boundaries, you struggle to understand and respect other people's boundaries. If you don't know how to be kind, you struggle to see kindness and to be kind to other people. So in terms of customers, if you can be kind to yourself, this will naturally trickle out to that business where you're selling water, right? Because you'll be able to actually be kind to a customer when they come in. You'll be able to pick up that it's 34 degrees and they don't need super excited salesperson at the door. They just need somebody to greet them in a neutral way and then build up the energy to the point where they can buy the water. But some of us are so caught up on the sales process that we actually neglect to pick up on normal and human behaviors and human emotions that you'll have somebody, you're exhausted and they're so enthusiastic, but like that irritating enthusiasm, enthusiasm, and you almost want to walk out, right? So we have to be in a position where we can pick up on the nuances and you can do this with yourself, where you can pick up on the nuances and learn from yourself that sometimes you are super enthusiastic to go to gym, sometimes you're not, but you still do it. And there's a way to learn how to do that. Um, <laughs> all right, and then you are in the people business. Okay, guys, we are humans. We are humans. Um, and I want to look at the subconscious as like the adult uh, imaginary friend, right? That's able, <laughs> that's able to be there and in terms of strategy of preeminence, they can be that mentor, they can be that parent that normally gets us to do things, they can be that whoever, but it's you, an extension of yourself, and that's the type of person we're trying to drive to get us, when people speak about introspection and getting yourself to do things, it's that voice or that person or that aspect of yourself that if you cultivate, and that's very sensitive, Right, so no jokes, no sarcasm. You have to be very clear about the type of conversation you have. And that person will eventually be so ideal for you that you will grow into that person. And so physically and mentally, and you won't have to, you won't separate the two. You will just be one, right? But as you're getting there, you do need to look at yourself from two versions, right? And we, we do see ourselves as other people, but sometimes we forget a little trick uh, to demonstrate that we, we do see ourselves as other people is there is like a, a little study. So if you have a physical shop, you can try this where if you constantly or normally have customers that complain either at the foyer or where you act at the till where you sell things um, or customer service, right? Because people normally complain there. Have a mirror behind you. That's pretty big, relatively big. And, and any person on average height can see themselves. The likelihood of people being, what's the nice word? Being uh, terrible people <laughs> when they're lodging a complaint, when, <laughs> when they are um, 
not happy about a service, a product, even if they rightfully have, you know, your product was bad that day or whatever, and they have every right to complain, to reduce that, ah, I hate your partner, put a mirror behind, because nobody wants to see themselves becoming or being horrible people. You can insert whatever word you use <laughs> for your clients and customers, but to reduce it, because nobody wants to see that because we have an innate self-preservation. So we always want to see ourselves in a very good light. So when you actually see yourself being like, oh, you're more likely to actually just be like, you'll still lodge the complaint, but you, you will just be a little bit more humane about it. Um, so that's just so that we understand that we are, we do actually see ourselves as other people. So we just need to be very conscious so we can actually use that as an ally type of thing to move forward. Um, so with that, don't be rude because you being rude to yourself and you think again in the thoughts, nobody can hear it, but you can. So think of it that way. If you think nobody can hear your thoughts, you can. If you think nobody can, you can. So if you're doing things privately, there's no such thing as privacy. Uh, the security companies in the world can try and imply such a thing. And it's almost funny that we're fighting for privacy when there's actually no such thing as privacy because we see ourselves do the things. So when you are sleeping for 12 hours and you tell people you wake up at five, you see yourself doing that and you're lying to yourself. And so you'll have that weird feeling of distrust of yourself. And you like, you, you can't pinpoint where it's from. It's from that thinking that you can't, you're not another person. So you don't see and nobody can see. And if nobody can see, then it's okay. But you are yourself. So don't be rude. Okay. Any questions, please just pop them in. As I said, I can't see the chat. So just give me a heads up if uh, any questions or anything like that. Um, and I am happy to stop and review some things. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank yeah. you so oh, much. Thanks. Sure. All right. So let's look at competitors, right? So as I said, it's looking at A, being the social medias. Uh, or whatever it is that you're doing instead of what you're supposed to be doing. So the competitors, what are they doing? In a business strategy, somebody else who's selling water, what are they doing? You know, if you're also selling water, what are they doing? And know what you're up against. It, but it is valuable for information for you. Uh, Apple knows exactly what other companies are doing. <laughs> but uh, Android knows exactly what... Uh, all the other people are, all their competitors are doing, right? They know. We might think that they don't care or they may be too big or whatever, but they know exactly what's happening, right? So Facebook analytics, if you've used them for your business, you will know they can tell you exactly who your client is to the skin tone, texture, I swear they can even tell you the size of their nose, the texture of their hair, the height. They can zone things to the T. Now, what does that mean? You're fighting, you're competing against someone who knows you better than you know yourself. And what do we do? We try and just do what we need to do. We don't actually try and leverage and see what are they doing. They're doing all this research about myself. Okay, why are they researching the mind? Why are they researching and using psychologists? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? And then actually borrow from that and be like, okay, clearly there's something there, right? Clearly there's a reason why the Zuckerbergs are paying neuropsychologists money. They're, not, they're very stra strategic about the use of money right? So why are they spending that much money on something that seems so detached from their actual business model? Something's there, right? So that means that we also have to know ourselves. I am more energetic in the morning. Therefore, perhaps I should be jogging in the morning or I should be doing things that are harder in the morning. So by the time 12 o'clock comes, it's fine. I've done the hard part of my life. I've done the hard activity of my life. Then it's okay. Then I won't be hard on myself as much, right? But they 
are to the point where mouse and um, the mouse the actual mouse if you're old enough to, <laughs> to know the scroll the actual scroll mouse um they changed that because this motion right i hope you can it looks weird but they feel like a youtuber yeah this motion this this little motion right was actually signifying and showing that people would one two three and at some point you actually get tired of doing this like think about it like you you actually get tired and so five seconds you take your finger off the mouse and then you're like oh before you go back a part of you says oh maybe you should go back to work right and the guilt gets you and you actually get back to work and so you don't go back to facebook so to stop you from that that's why you have mouse pads because you don't need to move your hand out as much right so they don't even, they don't even want to give you five seconds to, to just move your finger you need to be on all the time all the time because they know that five seconds of break can make the difference so the same thing we also need to be aware that they're using everything that ping for notification that ping is strategically placed they could have used another sound but they chose that ask yourself why because it resonates with us it feeds into that pleasure we get that pleasure that satisfaction then they touch into the ego like they they are dealing with subconscious level and we are still dealing with mind level we're still doing dealing with human level where they are beyond that and so we need to go a little bit deeper in our self knowledge go a little bit and be more attentive to our intuition and all that kind of stuff to help us leverage so that we actually have a chance so you actually feel okay i'm actually going to switch off the sound for the notification right you can start with just switching off the sound and then eventually you don't hear the sound so you you take off that association because pavlov experiment google pavlov salivating experiment and see how closely linked that is to that ping ping sound and how much they use it against us then you detach from the sound then you detach completely from the notification and then you get yourself to the point where you pick up your phone you go on to wechat and you know i'm going to isabel i'm going to get these i'm going specifically to maria and when i'm done with maria and i'm done with i will put my phone down and then i'll be okay and you stop this pervasive attachment to feeling like you need it all the time all the time all the time unless you're on call as a doctor you're not that needed and if you obviously as a business person you feel oh no my business is going to collapse put strategies in place so that the business doesn't collapse because it won't on average right if you have a proper strategy and a proper business set up it won't collapse if you don't check your phone and hear the ping all the time it it just won't um and again goes to boundaries setting boundaries and when you have boundaries people will respect them it might take some time because people aren't used to having boundaries so they feel rejected when you say don't call me after 9 they feel wait why right but eventually they'll understand you don't call me after 9 because i'm not going to answer the call and so logic will be like do i want to get a hold of this person yes okay if i call at 9 will they answer no oh okay so the logic is call at 8 right and that's people understanding boundaries and eventually they will okay so now you can get into what is your strategy how can you make your life writing the thesis more interesting more exciting more pleasurable than instagram than everything else right you need to get yourself into the thinking of really getting buckling down to doing that and i'm not going to get into how you can do that because i can't tell you that like i re- like honest to god i can't tell you how to make writing a thesis more fun for you you have to understand what value it brings to you and then what excites you why do you go to the club what what draws you to a club why do you buy a phone for 15000 renminbi what gets you to do that 
Get yourself into understanding why you do things that you do so that you, the understanding will teach you how to understand and also how to deal and to create a strategy. Okay, so that's just in, in just really ha. Huh. <laughs> okay, lots of talking for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so last <laughs> looking at here customers happy customers buy more or happy clients buy more if you are happy person you're more likely to go jogging more or hiking more if you're not you less likely to do it and so when you try to jio yourself into running it's it's harder it's just, it's just that much more work right so rewards make you feel special so get yourself that little rose get yourself that extra cotton satin whatever it is that you need to celebrate to signify as a reward right think about starbucks simple thing and i actually had my cup it was very funny um, I said my name is X and she wrote, she wrote XS, which works because it's my initials, but it makes me feel so special. And I know my name. Why should I feel special about my name on a cup? It's, but I still feel special. I'm like, oh, so cute. <laughs> right? So look at brands. How do they try to make their clients happy and their customers happy? And why do they do that? Because Starbucks could still sell you coffee without all of that really they really could go into that um so think about why do they invest in doing it why do they even you know even in china and starbucks being an american company they still trickle it throughout uh and why so why do they do that i have a question um sometimes i feel i can't beat my competitors because the huge loyal customers they got how can i deal with that with such a lack of confidence okay so a couple of things with confidence, right? Um, coming again to the introspection and getting to the strategy of preeminence. So, um, oh, so Isabel's asking the question. So I was trying to figure out who asked the question. So Isabel, I would look up Jay Abrahams. It's uh, really Icham. Icham asking the question. Oh, okay. So I thought, yeah, yeah. So Icham, uh, go look up Jay abrahams um and his strategy of going into business and how he goes about creating value because the thing is if you create value you will then raise you'll raise your confidence right when you do stuff so when you start exercising when you start writing the theories and the thesis you'll be confident because you are a doer we are very much doers as people. And so the more we do, the more we feel like, wow, I can do things. So in, in order to really cultivate confidence, I would start with little things. It doesn't have to be in relation to what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to go to gym, you can start winning or doing things on the other side. Start making your bed. If you say you're going to make a bed, make a bed. It, it feels like it's not connected, but the thing is, it's more of a thought, a thought process. Everything is very much a thought process and getting yourself into the rhythm of thinking. And then you build your confidence slowly but surely. And then you can, now that you're more confident, you can now add more things. So the same thing with trust. If you've broken trust, you have to do. The more you say, the more you might destroy. But the more you do to prove your trust, the more you build, you build, you build, and then a person can ask more of you from a trust perspective. So in terms of building long-term confidence, start doing. And from a business perspective, start doing as well. Like when you feel like, okay, I should probably be doing this, start doing it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Not you, it doesn't work. The strategy that you tried didn't work. If you try to do A, it doesn't work. It, not you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then going to here, it actually kind of ties in. Uh, predictable customers are the best. If you know that at one o'clock, your customer is on their phone at WeChat, and you know if you just post 
a very, very beautiful meal, they're more likely to buy from you, then you will do that, right? Because they're predictable. So the same thing with you, routine. If you get yourself into a routine, if you get yourself into a way that you can predict yourself. I know that if you were to ask me, for example, to speak to a thousand people, I might freak out. So I have to then go back to how I prepped when speaking for two people, right? And I look at that and I look, okay, from, then I can predict how I will react in front of a thousand people. And that saves me a lot of anguish because now if I know how I'm going to react, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to stumble. Okay, well, if I'm going to be nervous, I need to handle nerves. Firstly, nerves and excitement are the same thing. Change your perspective about that because it's the same thing. Okay, uh, it has the same physiological experience you go through the same physiological experience so just change your perspective about that and then i might forget my words well i start learning my words so that when i come in front of a thousand people i don't have a problem but i was able to predict how i will react therefore i can prepare for it so going back to know thyself um and then if you can predict your excuses if you can predict what you're going to say about running you can fix it you can get on top of it. Um, and if you don't sell yourself today, if you can't get yourself to run today, be honest with yourself as to why you weren't able to do that. Review the sales process. Review how you got yourself doing what you needed to do. Not you. Because the minute you then start attacking yourself, you then are destroying your biggest ally. And, and that then puts you in a position where you actually won't be able to get yourself in the same mood, in the same excitement. Right. Um, if you then if you if the customer doesn't buy, <laughs> it's the salesperson's fault, not the customer. Right. And this you can use in sales. Like when you're selling your water, remember, everything is then always your fault, because then you can look at what you what did you do? And, and look, and I'm talking the skills, not you. So don't get into emotions and think about, I'm a terrible person. Look at what did you do? What did you say? When did you say it? When did you talk to them? And then fix that, adjust that, move that around. And then you're dealing with, with a skill, you're dealing what you need, with what you need to do, and you're not attacking yourself. Review questions. Um, and then we're going to go into objections. And obviously those, that's a very big thing <laughs> or excuses. Uh, so do I know who I am? Valuable question. Um, what do I do when an event like cover kills your product? Do you innovate or do you just change? Oh, like COVID. <laughs> I was like, what's cover? Okay, so what do you do in an event like COVID kills your product? Do you, in, do you innovate or do you just change fields? Go back to you, right? There are ways, and I'm going to keep going back to Jay Abraham because one of the ways, one of the things that he does, he is a synthesizer and he basically has worked with companies in Japan, China, the States, everywhere, left, right, and center. and as long as a, a J. Abraham exists, it means that there's answers to every question in relation to your business and saving your business. Your perspective might then be hindered because what you'll find is that you're thinking, okay, COVID has hindered my business. I need to close shop. This is horrible. Wow. And then you call J. Abrahams and then he says, okay, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. You need to A, B, C, D, which means there wasn't actually, it's not that there weren't answers to your questions. It's that you weren't able to see them. So I will always say instead of closing shop or uh, giving up completely, I would have a different perspective. Again, go back to industries, go to different industries. If you're in marketing, look at things like vets. Look at how vet, uh, vet and all these cute, um, what do they call them? The cute, where they have cats and you just pet them. I don't know how those companies survive, but they're everywhere, right? So there's clearly something being done, right? Go and look at how they're doing it. 
mingle with people outside of your industry go to doctors conferences see how doctors are selling everything right because whether you like it or not your doctor sells you everything as well so look at how they're doing it and try and think okay what am i not seeing what am i not seeing right now i'm seeing a closed door but what else am i not seeing there's always another side to something and then if not collaborate and i mean these will be the strategies which will pop up collaborate with somebody um this there's an ego element especially as business people and humans in general to always want to protect what's mine look after what's mine so that i can have the glory because it is mine and i did it and sometimes you just need to find somebody else and collaborate with them and they may be the people that catapult your business to the next level and you'll find like more and more and i I'm, maybe just i didn't think of this and i like flower shops and coffee shops that makes sense to me i'm seeing that happening more and more right but when i was growing up it was always a coffee shop it was always a flower shop but i think at some point they realized this is a good combo and then they collaborated so find if you're really struggling who can you collaborate with and really expand yourself now you have the world open so you no longer just have china look at the fact that the internet opens up to the whole world i mean i have somebody who uh, specifically said they were going to come so i'm going to just make an announcement that they're in south africa right now right and basically it would be that i would be talking to people in china right now or people okay china being the fact that you guys are associated with china to some degree i know not everybody's actually in china but they are completely in south africa that means that you can actually conversate with people outside of where you are this is that looking of what am i not seeing question 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 all the time okay <laughs> um and then looking again so knowing who i am um do i know why i want to do this uh that could go into your business do you really know why you're selling what you're selling do you know why you got into the business of what you got into um and what will i gain from this i'm going to be a phd major i'm going to be this beautiful fit and gorgeous person what do you get out of um once you get the commission what are you going to get out of it and what type of pitch did you give was it kind or did you pressure if you pressure a client you think you're not pressuring they'll pick it up and pressuring usually comes from desperation so if you come from a desperation even if you haven't made sales in like a year and you really need money i would be very attentive to desperation and you'll hear this with with men <laughs> and they'll say they can smell desperation from a woman so even the most beautiful woman if she goes to a club and she's sitting at a club and she's trying to look like she's not looking for a man like oh i'm so independent i'm so happy they can smell and they don't come to you right but if you come there and you're confident and you don't care they're like bees they're right because you can smell desperation and we think no it's an emotion you you can smell desperation and so the same thing customers can smell pressure and even for yourself when you're forcing yourself that's where it comes in when you're forcing yourself to do things it you you feel it and you actually almost become childish you like actually no i don't want to wake up actually right um so just be very attentive be kind in in conversation and thought and all that you do when it comes and in relation to yourself did i learn how to communicate with myself learn how to talk to yourself i speak a couple of languages depending on what i need to do i need to tap i need to tap in a certain language if i'm feeling very lazy and i say the words i am feeling lazy today that does nothing to me that's just a classification oh yeah i feel lazy okay cool but the minute i say gevila which is just the zulu translation or i am lazy i'm like ooh like my heart is like okay you know um and sometimes now i kind of dabble into uh chinese if i'm trying to motivate myself and i'm running and i'm getting really exhausted i'll say jaya exhale and it actually puts a little extra step so you know learn how to communicate with yourself if if you don't speak 
as a language is, you know, you have to just be deliberate about your word choice. But for me, I understand now being multilingual, I dabble in every language available to me. I even touch on Spanish and I know like 10 words, but I will, if I need it, I will bring it in. <laughs> and did you make the sale easy? Um, and did you ask more than once? So now in terms of oh, sale process, some people make it exhaustive. I am currently speaking to somebody right now and they're kind of selling me a very high end product and in terms of like um, money wise. And then they sent me an email and then I have to go into the email and then I have to click a link. And then when I click that link, it's going to take me to somewhere else. And then when I get to that somewhere else, it's going to click me to somewhere else. And only then will I be able to have two choices to choose something else to be able to pay. Ooh, wow. Wow. Why? Why? Right? Like, so what we do is that we then don't have our tackies. We have our trainers and our sneakers hidden under our blanket somewhere out there so when you're trying to get yourself to run it's a process just to look for the clothes to wear now you're fighting with the fact that you don't even have the clothes to wear when you're writing you know you've prepped the whole year for your thesis but you've written on pieces of paper that are under the kitchen in the bathroom now you're actually wanting to start you've got yourself at the desk you're wanting to do something but you now have to go and look for page number three, which has the most vital information. And then you say to yourself, yeah, Netflix, hmm, maybe a little bit better right now, you know? And that's how Netflix wins because it's easy. Netflix, you go in, you in and you watch. It's easy to get to them. Instagram, go in and in and you, walk and you start going through photos. Everything is quick, 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 right? Um, did you ask more than once? When you're communicating and you're having your sales pitch with somebody, ask more than once. You don't have to be like, do you want to buy? There's ways of getting confirmation from somebody. Uh, for example, you always have people ask somebody, why did you decide to join the webinar? That is an unconscious confirmation, like a, a subtle yes or agreement to the sale because you are now going to give me an answer that convinced you, which means if you're convincing yourself, you're saying yes. So if you have your client and you have a process that they have to go through to find you or something, so they scan something, and the first thing you ask them after obviously greeting them and being polite and kind, you ask them, so what, what drew you to wanting to work with me? I'm, I'm sure you have many photographers, videographers, lawyers, doctors that you could have gone to, what made you click on that QR code? And that is a very good strategy because that will give you reason as to their thinking and then you can move your sales strategy towards that way. Now, you, if your sales strategy has a lot of fluff and the person doesn't need it, you can throw it away and just deal with that person based on what they are looking for. And you can tailor your conversation based on that, right? When you're trying to get yourself to gym, annoy yourself like a little child. We need to run. Mommy, we need to run. Mommy, run. Uh, and eventually, what do you do? You give them what they want. So yourself, you get yourself in a position where you ask and ask and ask. And you constantly, I would even record like in your playlist, when you have a playlist and you listen to music, I would record something in relation to getting yourself to do something so that you play music, play music, play music. And there's a point where it's like, I should be running. And that's just going to break you for a little bit. And that's an extra thing just to irritate you. And then eventually you're just going to be like, ah, oh, let me just run. <laughs> let me just do this running thing. Um, go big. Uh, these are very, very typical things that you use for sales. Go big, throw out all unhealthy food, ban friends from, um, uh, what's it called is band friends that make you do strange things from coming to your house, all that kind of stuff, really be dramatic about your movement. Um, and then clean house, your attitude to yourself, your attitude about yourself and what you achieve and what you have achieved is very important. Um, and so please be very aware of your mental state and how you're communicating with yourself. If you need somebody for guidance and you need a model, 
look for somebody that is as closely related or relatable to you. I would go maybe just a little bit better than you so that it doesn't feel too big. If you have a business that's pulling in 1500, don't now compare to Apple. I, I get the motivation and the and thinking big, but just pull it here to a company that might be making 200 to five, just so that it's a little bit close, but still a little bit ahead of you. Get to a point where you can do what they're doing to get you to that two five and then rely on the ego. An ego has a self preservation. And so you always want to feel like you did something. So naturally you will evolve what they do in a way that you have tailored to yourself because you want to make it yours. It's a natural thing. If you have a role model and you'll see this with entertainers, they'll come in and every presenter looks like the same presenter that's been around. And then eventually people will say they found their feet. That finding feet is when your ego has stepped in and said, okay, we're going to lay claim to this and we are going to tailor this in a way that makes it ours. And that is a very powerful position because now you've gained value from other people and now you can add value from yourself for yourself. Um, and then we're going to be closing with uh, just looking at attitude, positive attitude always wins. And you will see this, nobody buys from a grumpy person. Nobody runs when they're grumpy. Unless you're a professional runner, your likelihood of getting yourself to do anything when you're grumpy is very, very low. Uh, live your new re reality. Look at what it would be like if you were the person that you're trying to be. If you did the things that you are avoiding. Look at what that looks like. What does the lawyer who now has graduated because they did the, the thesis or they studied, what does that look like? That will tie into being sold on the offer. If you're not sold on your own product, try as you may, try as you may to sell water to somebody. They will not buy it from you. You might find a couple of people just because they really need it. They might buy it. But somebody that is a client will not buy from you if you don't believe in your product, right? So really know that, know your value preposition and always agree with your client. Now, I'm gonna give you an example with a person yourself. If you wake up in the morning and you're trying to tie your shoelaces and a part of you is like, I hate running. Just be like, yeah, I know you hate running. And I know it's a conversation in your head. Be like, yeah, I know you hate running, but keep on tying your shoelaces. Right. And the same thing now in relation to your client, they'll come in and they say, wow, I, I, I don't have money. And what do you say? Yeah, 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 I know the economy is bad. The economy is bad. Don't pretend like what they just said is not true. Just agree with them. It's true to them. So therefore agree with them. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're lying to them. It means that you're agreeing with their perspective because people like people that are like themselves. And so if you think like me, based on the fact that you agreed with me, right, I'm more likely to be open minded to anything that you have to say, because I assume you think like me. So really just be open to that um, and agree with your client. Demonstrate, put on your shoelaces, put, get to the desk, get that pen and actually start moving and doing things. Uh, and then assume, assume the clothes. There's nothing more awkward than a client that's ready to buy and a salesperson that's going around the bush because they either don't know how to close, don't know what the next step is. And there's that awkward moment where the client almost wants to be like, where do I sign? So just assume clothes and just be like, oh, uh, so what's your credit card number? Oh, um, will that be WeChat or Alipay? Just get to it. Just get to it, right? So that they, oh, yeah, yeah, no, Alipay is okay. It's cool. Oh, okay, cool. That's great. And then just move on because now they've agreed to pay. And now you're talking to somebody that's bought your product, not trying to buy your product. And that's a different type of animal altogether. So really be in a position where in terms of your behavior now, really put yourself in a position where get to the kitchen. Stop chopping that healthy food. Just get to it. Don't, don't get deep into it. Just get to it and start um, really 
uh, chopping and cooking and wearing the trainers and getting to the desk. Just assume you want to do this. And then it will be easier. It will be kind of awkward. Now you're at the desk and you're sitting there. Your phone is over there. And now you're standing there like, okay. And then the only thing almost left to do is do what you have to do, right? Uh, my favorite part, how do you guys feel about handling objections? <laughs> when, you, when you're talking to your clients and then they have this long list of excuses or objections available all of a sudden after they looked like they were ready to buy how do you guys normally handle that <laughs> i need some water Woo. oh <laughs> okay i'll give you guys a heads up um so just in terms of looking at handling objections. I think if you can learn how to handle objections, you are a certified sales profession. You are amongst the greats because that's where a lot of people struggle. Many people can offer value to of their product. Many people can get the, pe get the customer or client to hear, but many people can't handle excuses, right? Oh, no, no, but my leg is sore. I can't do that. Okay, well, just put a bandage. If you just put a bandage around your leg, you'll be fine. Do handle. Move on. Next thing. Oh no, it's so hot today. Okay, let's put sunscreen and wear a hat. Handle. Excuse. Gone. Right. So the same thing when you have a, a client coming to you. I work in um, the ESL uh, training center industry, and it's almost known that women, in general. <laughs> handle the money and typically typically and i'm not trying to be sexist but in a in a couple um especially in china there, there is like a little story that women handle the money right in knowing that i worked with um a lady that we were my, one of my colleagues and basically they do the closing part so i do the sales part and then they go do close that means they have to handle the excuse part of things now knowing and and i'm saying this because she was one of the ladies that actually even said this that you know when you married you control your husband's wallet and all that stuff right now she's faced with a, a a wife who is now here who wanted to join the company but now the wife says to her excuse me um i need to go talk to my husband <laughs> If, if, if it's known that women control the wallet, what husband is there to talk to, right? Like if she can go and buy Gucci bag without consulting her husband, what makes you think she needs to consult her husband to pay for her children's education? So that's a blatant excuse, blatant excuse. And even in that moment, she didn't pick up on that yeah very good yeah you need to be emotionally intelligent enough to handle objections and and catch them out and be able to be confident enough to throw in a joke like oh really we all know no husbands control the wallet and that's like ha 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 but that breaks that moment of excuse because she knows it's true she knows there was no husband to be consulting there's something that made her not want to sign or not want to buy at that moment and you need to deal with that not this fluff that's now imaginary husband who's controlling wallet there's no such thing i'm kidding i don't have a husband so please don't quote me on that <laughs> but basically don't avoid excuses do not avoid excuses please face your excuses and i would say call them out i'm tired today no you're not stop it you've been sleeping for 12 hours can we just can we just get on with this right um and then learn how to not outsmart yourself because we are actually smart humans we are actually logical humans and we can actually talk ourselves out of everything and anything right so learn how to catch those moments and break them however you need to break them and take full responsibility and review the process uh keep things positive go back again to knowing yourself and what you're saying with uh bachara i hope i'm pronouncing it right um i think it requires a lot of work on yourself first 
the ability to not take personal yes anything they say about your product what they say about your product is what not what they say about yourself that's the way i see it absolutely if you are if you're too lazy or you don't want to do something it's just that's it's, that's just it right it's not personal it's not you're now a failure so if the client doesn't want to buy your water it's not personal it means that you weren't able to resonate with them at that moment or you weren't able to call out on they call them out on their bs excuse that they're trying to throw at you and i think there there needs to be a little bit more courage from sales people to call people out on bs when you come into a shop and you are 99% likely to be my client and you're not buying you have to have the courage to tell me why and we have to learn how to bring that across in a in a way that's not aggressive but be very forward and you know like you i you know you need this i know you need this water so i'm help me understand why you don't want this water why you don't want me. I wouldn't use my because then that might be personal but why you don't want to buy this water now and if you've set the whole process up and they trust you they will say they will tell you why they don't want to do it and that you can use as a strategy and you can almost thank them and even if they don't buy you'd be like okay thank you I actually didn't think about that and you go back to the drawing board and you have another excuse or you have another objection that you write down and you write how you handle it you have to have a strategy of handling your objections when a customer calls and complains about something write it down what do they complain about and write how you handled it how did they leave happy how did you go about this what did you say even right especially for those very sticky very awkward very hard things think about that okay um and then lastly i think to just to end off ooh. oh okay uh please listen um uh selectively and take the no but listen very selectively so that you can again cut the bs and get to the point of why somebody is not wanting to buy or be uh in working relationship get to the bs as to why you're not wanting to exercise why you're not wanting to do what you need to do really be clear about that uh, and then be persistent be transparent nobody likes a slick sales person don't lie to yourself be honest um and then that will reduce the likelihood of you not uh of you not procrastinating <laughs> uh, but yeah that for me will be the end of it Oh, Maria, I just missed you. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to stop you here. <laughs> I'm just going to check just for questions that I have answered because I haven't been able to see the chat. Um, I don't think we have okay. any new ones. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. But, would... um, <laughs> does, does, anybody, does anybody have a question for X? Okay. <laughs> Don't all jump at once, guys. <laughs> oh yeah, Hitchum. Hitchum says go. yes. Uh, Hitchum, let me let me unmute your mic and then you can go ahead. Uh in fact go ahead and unmute yourself and then just ask your question. Feel free. Hitchum? Oh there you go. Uh, thank you for for your uh, presentation i really appreciate yeah. it yeah it's a pleasure thank you so my question is uh in many different uh area of my business i'm trying to be perfect yeah with even with my customer with with my strategy of sale and marketing but sometimes uh, i found many obstacle and mistake mm -hmm. so I don't know actually how I can deal with that, with being, I'm trying to be perfect with each customer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very hard to make yeah. all your customer satisfied mm -hmm. with the product. Yeah. Can, can I ask what, what kind of business you're in? Uh, 
uh, I have an uh, online store selling uh, decoration. Like house deco or? The, uh, yes, like wall art. Yeah. Canva painting like this. Yeah, okay. So you're looking at perfection and you're trying to achieve perfection and on the way you're having a couple of mistakes and you're having a couple of obstacles and you're wanting to see how you can deter and basically reduce that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm just going to come in from question. Uh, firstly, what, and you don't have to answer, uh, but what does perfection mean to you, right? Um, what are you trying to gain from the perfection? What's the point of having the perfection? Is it making you look like you are a better salesperson? You are the better uh, company to go to there. And, and I would watch, I would watch your ego. I would watch ego because perfectionism is very much driven with ego. So that need to appear to be perfect is driven from a self-preservation. So look at why you are interested in being seen as perfect, because I can guarantee your clients or your customers don't think themselves as perfect. And so they would be open to some mistakes. If you present yourself as human, as somebody who makes mistakes, but if you present yourself as a perfect, like a perfect company, and then you make mistakes, I have every right to call you out now because you've promised me perfection. And when I don't get that, I can then call you out. But if you never promise perfection and you personally, you can promise personalization, you can promise attentiveness, and so when you don't do those things, the stumbling or the mistakes that happen, the way that I will respond to you will be different, which means your customers are less likely not to run away from you. That will also just raise your confidence and you won't need to, ha you won't have that need for perfectionism in your company because that's a very dangerous company to buy from because that means that I have to be a perfect client as well. And, and that can make people a little bit uncomfortable. Okay, so I just look from ego perspective. Yeah, it's a fair answer, thank you. Sure thing, great. Uh, I think it was May that said you wanted for note taking, the last slide, I hope. Okay, do we have any more questions? <laughs> and yes, it was Mel. Yeah, Mel. Okay, cool. All right, do, do we have any more questions? Um, let's, let's ask all the questions we want whilst we still have them. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Hello, William. Hello, Hi, how are you doing? I'm very well, how are you? Fine, fine, I have a question. And then I have shoot. another question. Oh shoot, let's go. Uh, have you had a bottle of water yet? Cause you get a lot of talking. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> I do. I'm running out. I'm running out. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Um, you had touched on a lot of things. You, you talked about COVID-19. Uh, you talked about uh, how people uh, should change, I guess, in, in essence, about what's going on uh, as a result mm -hmm. of COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of... Um, for one thing, for me, uh, I, I've been here in, in China for quite some time. And yeah. what COVID-19 reminds me of, I don't know if I'm giving a question or a statement. It, it reminds me of China when I first came here. And that mm -hmm. aspect is, it was not a lot of foreigners over here that had a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of people not able to come back here right now, there's like a, a, a need for people who want to do business in China, but they're unable to come back here to do that business. So mm -hmm. what I've, I've done is that I've taken all my previous experience and I pretty much like you said, take notes, document, things of that nature. So my question is, how do you look at pivoting? When someone pivots from one aspect of their business and going into another? How, how do they go about it? What would be the strategy to go about it? Pivot, yes, to pivot. Yeah. From one part of their business and, and going into a different area. 
Okay. So touch touch base and look at and, and I like that you say that you capture and you've been able to document your past experiences. So for me, I would look at um, the story of uh, Corolla, Toyota. So if you know the story of Toyota, Toyota came in obviously known as a reliable company, et cetera, et cetera. And then they wanted to go into luxury cars. So they tried to like bring out this very luxurious Toyota type of car and it flopped completely, right? But they came back with the Lexus. That was a completely new product, completely, but it's still the child of Toyota and that has done that much better. So I think in some instances, you can look at, you can extend what you currently have and it might work, it might not work. Sometimes you just need to start a completely new thing and you don't need to attach yourself to it. You can be a completely, uh, it won't just, be, it won't be X as a mental strategist. It would be a company. And if you dig deep enough, you'll know that X runs it, right? So they, they're again, try, coming and trying to tie ourselves to all these things. I would just start off completely in the same way that you got yourself successful with the business that you have now or the strategy that you have now start something else completely and not attach yourself to it. So that's how I would essentially pivot. Mind, do you mind if I chime in? Right. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, hi, William. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> um, uh, an, another strategy would be to look at the, mar the market that you already have and mm -hmm. try to identify what new need they have according to the changes because the changes yeah. have affected everybody. So yeah. um, you could just still look at the same people that know you and trust you and have done business with you for years and just look at what you need they might have um, given, yeah. given the changes that have happened to not only China, but the world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> any more questions? Any more questions? Um, we're, we're running a little... Um, over time, but <laughs> that also speaks to the value that you've given us. Um, so if anybody else, um, if anybody else feels like, uh, if anybody else has a question, let's ask it whilst we have her. All right, feel free to unmute yourself. HM says thank you. Ah, oh, pleasure, HM. It's All right. a pleasure. Questions. This is fun. Questions going once. Yeah. <laughs> going twice. Going twice. And, and late it. night. It's a sale. Yeah. Um, close. Sales close. <laughs> All right. So I, I guess we close the meeting. Um, mm -hmm. thank you guys for coming again. Thank you for trusting us, um, with your evenings. Uh, Isabel had, had <laughs> to leave. She had another, um, meeting or workshop that she had to be in. Um, so see you next time. I think we have, um, we have another meeting next Thursday and, uh, just join in. Let's continue to grow together. And, um, if you want to get in touch, there we go. We have a question. Aww. Thank you, Harvey. <laughs> what's the host's name? <laughs> and what's her my name? <laughs> um, uh, Mel, my name is X or Olisi Lesitole. Mm -hmm. And my profession is I am a mental health strategist. That's my the business that I go into. So that's where the synthesizing um, comes in. And I also am a teacher in China. Um, if you wanting to engage with my work or my content, you can look for this. Olisile, uh, it's a mouthful. <laughs> you can uh, just so, type it in the chat, and um, you can also you can also reach out in the uh, Teranga Valley group. Yeah. Um, so that you can get a contact or reach out to Isabel or myself, and we'll share. Um, X's contact.
Um, yeah, feel free. I'm more active on LinkedIn, very, very active on LinkedIn. Um, you'll be able to see where I come from and how all of this comes together. Um, but thank you for the question, Mark. So uh, if you want her contact, reach out to Isabel or reach out to me. My WeChat is in the chat box. Yeah. All right. I can add my WeChat actually. Let me check if I remember. This is my WeChat. Just look up that. Oh, I'm glad that was helpful now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. We appreciate you and see you next week. We appreciate you. Yay. Yeah. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, <laughs> Thanks. This was really good. This was really, really good and valuable.